Thank you, good afternoon. And I appreciate you all skipping your lunch to hear me talk about reigniting growth. So, we shall get into it. Uh, slides? Oh, how are you? Um, so, the reason I want to talk about reigniting growth is purely because I think we all need to do it in some way. As we know, 2021 was the best of times. If you had a startup in 2021, everything was amazing, right? You, uh, in 2021, we saw VC investment double. We saw more unicorns, believe it or not, than ever before in 2021. We saw more mega rounds, these like $100 million rounds, than ever before. And we saw more, like, more basically everything than ever, ever before in the tech industry. In short, I would say 2021 was a hell of a drug. And we saw some mad shit happen in our industry. We saw secondaries being done at the seed stage. We saw founders starting their own funds. Operating costs went up. People started moving to Miami for some reason. Like uh, there was celebrity investors. There was like 500x multiples and rounds and all the other sort of mad shit. And what could possibly go wrong? Well, it turns out a lot of shit. Uh, so 2022, 2023 has not been great, right? The deals, as we can see, are disappearing. Um, as you can see, there's been like a precipitous drop here. The unicorns are fading away. Maybe they were mystical creatures after all. The mega rounds are disappearing. Uh, we're not seeing them anymore. And IPOs are disappearing. We're not seeing them anymore. So, in short, this is fine, right? It's a tough time to be in tech. Now, a phrase I often come back to is the Stockdale paradox. You should not confuse the fate that you will prevail, which you can never afford to lose, with the discipline of confront confronting the brutal reality that we're in in tech, right? It is not a great time. So founders everywhere are worried about all of these key metrics, whether it's your burn rate, your LTV CAC, your gross revenue retention, your runway, your churn. We're worried about all of these things. And what I hope to present to you today is five points on how we're gonna get, out, get the hell out of this, right? The first thing we have to do when we're facing this horrible reality is work out what bit of my company actually is working. So what does this mean? Well, during the good times, you tend to be quite explorative. You tend to try a lot of new shit, right? You, you're very, um, you're, you're interested in like uh, new projects, new ambitions, new teams, new expenses. And during the harder times, you need to peel all that shit away. And the big question you have to ask yourself is, what revenue that I have is healthy and what revenue is not healthy? And I think for a lot of startups I've invested in, for a lot of startups I've worked with or advised, they had a healthy business. They added a lot of shit to it, and now they have an unhealthy business. But at the very core of the startup is still a good idea that people really want to use. It's just surrounded by a lot of junk. And the reality is, if you add shit to a business, you get a shit business, right? It's, there's no way to avoid that, unfortunately. So you need to find out who your best customers are and, ba and you need to optimize the business for them. Your best customers are ones that you can sustainably acquire, ones who use your product deeply, and ones who get differentiated value. So you have to be able to afford to get them, they have to use your product a lot, and they have to use it for something that they just can't get anywhere else, okay? And to get there, you have to analyze your revenue by, first of all, what we call CAC, cost of acquisition. Secondly, uh, the depth of the channel. So you might have a great way to acquire a customer, but if you can't acquire thousands through that channel, it's not a good channel. Next is usage. Are we a critical product or are we a nice to have? And lastly is differentiation. Are we a commodity or are we something unique to this person? You need four yeses for each of these questions to actually know do you have a healthy business. That's the first piece you have to do. Secondly, we need to cut a lot of junk out of businesses, a lot of complexity, right? The single biggest thing that hurts a healthy business is adding complexity, getting this idea that you're a bigger company than you were, trying to transform too quickly into being enterprise when you're not even 100 people or something like that. And this shows up everywhere. Complex ads where you're trying to say too many things, complex landing pages, pitches, sign-up flows, complex UI, a complex org chart, your complex processes. You had a simple with business, and you really junked it up. So, no one ever says, hey, Des, I've got an idea. How about we make this business really, really complex? Right? That's not what happens. What they say is, there's a second use case we could consider. There's a second buyer. Or, how about users who don't do this? How can we persuade them? Or, how about we take this simple thing and make it slightly hard? Right? So, what happens is you get lured into complexity. And what it looks like, if you take a really simple process, let's say this is your sign-up funnel, right? Hey, people go to the homepage and they click a link. Somebody eventually says, hmm, 
I think we could catch an extra bit of options here, and or extra bit of usage or revenue. And what they usually face you with is a question like this: Should we attract more customers or not? And of course you're like, yeah, of course we should attract more customers. Duh, right? So you you concede the point. Oh, and to make it worse, the. Uh, these people would usually bring along evidence like this, right? These people have all the charts and you know spreadsheets and forecasts that say this is going to be brilliant. And over here, you're just like, oh, I don't know. This kind of feels like it could be shit. So you're having this horrible uh, battle of like data versus intuition, and you're going to lose. So you lose, and losing looks like this. And you say, right, let's do another use case. Let's do another buyer. Let's do another route to market. And then you say, OK, let's do a few more. And let's do a few more and a few more. And before you know it, you actually have this complexity, right? You get lured into it. You raised a big round at a big valuation. You need to justify it so you have this big, wide-eyed ambition. And you end up with this. And what it looks like is shit like this. Like this is honestly a lot of sign -up startups have this as their road mapping process or have this as their sign-up flows. And people massively underestimate the cost of complexity, friction, putting nonsense into your business. Uh, Aaron Levy is the founder of Box, and he had a series of three tweets that I thought were brilliant on this exact topic. The first point he says is, every single thing that creates friction costs you adoption, costs you customers. The second point is, complexity kills productivity. It just kills it stone dead, always. And the third one is, like, if you can just simplify things, everything will always get better. And what was more interesting out of this conversation was really influential, smart people like Steve Sinofsky, like uh, Mark Pincus from Zynga, had other ideas that, that fell out of this. One was, my rule of thumb is that for every choice you put on a user, you lose half your audience. And if you act on that rule, you'll actually make good decisions. A second point is usability goes down. And the last point from Spencer here I love, which is that friction is not linear with adoption. It is actually exponential, right? What we think we're doing often, uh, sorry for the arrows, uh, what we think we're doing often when we say, hey, well, we get out a bit of friction by adding some choices. And we think we're doing this in a, Sort of simple, every extra choice is a little bit more complicated, right? And that's OK because the ROI justifies it. But in practice, it actually looks more like this. Every extra choice makes your business horrendously more difficult to, to do, right? Every little bit, bit of knit or grit will slow things down in a way that you don't realize and you can't forecast. So the next time you're faced with a decision of should we attract more customers or not, the actual better question to ask yourself is, should we attract more customers or should we improve our funnel the way it is? Should we perfect our current business? Should we get a market dominant position for who we are today? And that is actually a better question to ask. And you also have to, to win the argument, you have to price in this downside. We're going to make our UX really, really sucky if we continue to add complexity here. So I really implore you all to consider simplifying the hell out of your healthy business. When you've done that, you can then optimize a healthy business. So, to optimize a healthy business, recall, a healthy business, you have to know certain things about your customers. You know things like uh, what vertical are they in, what team are they, how do they use your product, what types of customers, you name it, right? There's a lot of stuff you need to know about your customers to know if they are healthy. So, Generally speaking, I encourage every startup, whether I invest in them, advise them, or even intercom ourselves, we always ask these questions to understand where is our healthy usage? Where is the strong part of the business? And from there, we can build a lot out, right? Uh, and Sorry, one more. Here's a real world example, right? So this is a, a product management startup, a pro project management startup that I invested in, where I got them to ask the, uh, answer these questions. And once you actually get to these answers, you start to realize, okay, this is something we can actually work with. Right? We now know a lot about our businesses. We now know a lot about where we can invest. We know what we need to get right and what we can perfect, et cetera. And from this, we were able to say, if this is exactly who we need to perfect our business for, let us, let's have everyone delete all their roadmaps and their plans, and let's only do shit that maximizes the quality of the product for this exact customer. And that means asking hard questions like, what are the most important things that we have to do uh, to maximize throughput, if you like, to make this so easy to adopt? And it's really important to say not what's important or by what means is the work you're doing important, but it's, you forget all that and you say, what is the most important thing? And then you have to then ensure that you're doing all of the most important things and you're doing nothing else. 
nothing comes for free in, in, in business, right? And the worst, the thing that every startup does is this bottom line, they post-rationalize. They say, given that I was gonna run that campaign anyway, we may as well finish it, right? Wrong. Everything you do has to be the most important thing. The phrase people often say is, you the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing, right? It's so important to obsess about the actual thing you're doing. So, what does that look like? Well, the things you must do is one, uh, Ensure every function basically has blank sheeted everything so they're not inheriting any complexity that they added two years ago. Uh, change your funnel around the business customers you're trying to win and ensure that like, all your metrics and dashboards track this successful business and they ignore the unhealthy piece that didn't work. And lastly, kill all the activities that don't support the strategy. And the things you definitely don't do, one, don't post-rationalize anything. Make it illegal to justify activities based on what came before. Secondly, don't keep giving away exceptions for this or exceptions for that. You're just going to end up getting dragged right back to where you were. And lastly, don't celebrate success that had nothing to do with the plan. You might have won a great customer last week for the old use case. It's not good news today. We're only caring about what we're doing today. Uh, and don't continue with any decisions or meetings or anything that supports the old business. Now, what's interesting is when you do this is, you might see, going back to our earlier example, here's the healthy revenue, and what we're, our job is to grow the healthy revenue. We have to be tolerant of the fact that the unhealthy revenue might shrink because it is not the priority, which means you might see this, right? This is a growing business that looks like a shrinking business. And that's okay, because you'll invest in this business. People will work for this business, and you need to talk about this business. Whereas this, if that's your narrative, it doesn't sound good, and it's just important that people know the difference. And then when you've done these things, this is when we actually get to have the conversation of, okay, we've found our customers, we've simplified, we now have a healthy business. How do we grow that business? And that, that it, for me, is like there are four choices you have. Right, so if you start off with a current healthy business, the obvious one that most people will do is you can go up market, right? That means just selling to larger co companies. Selling to larger companies, the same product, but you have to adapt it for larger uh, customers. Uh, another option is you can sell more stuff to the current buyer. So, hey, I know I'm currently selling you like social media software. Would you also like to have a listening or brand managing, management software? Or we're selling you customer support. Would you like a phone solution? We just launched a phone solution yesterday. Um, Another option is to sell to a different buyer in the same company, which is, means ultimately launching a new product line, but you, you, you have to believe that the fact that you have the customer already will help you get there. And then lastly, you can tailor your business for a new vertical. So in this world, it will be like, we're going to do intercom but for airlines or intercom but for hotels or whatever, right? It would be like tailoring it that way. To go through them quickly, um, Firstly, take your current product of market. What's good here is that you get more money, you get less churn, the customers don't die like startups do. Uh, they generally tend to use you longer, they, uh, they'll sign longer contracts. What's hard is you have to build a lot of new stuff. That's just the reality of going with market. You have to build a lot of OAuth, permissions, security, all that sort of shit. Marketing changes, self-serve sign-up is no longer the thing. Now you're into like outbounding, you're into bigger sales teams, etc. Uh, and your sales cycles are longer. You, you know, just because somebody is, expresses interest today, you might land them in a year, but like, that's just tricky, right? Um, and support gets more complicated. They're more demanding. Or you can do more product for your current buyers. What's good here, again, is more money. They increase your share of wallet, as they say. You can improve your product posture, so you can basically have to be a more complete platform. Uh, and you have an existing trusting buyer. But the hard part is you need to build a whole new product. And that's a whole new team, and that's a new expense, and that's spending more money, et cetera. Uh, you have to market uh, a now a more abstract concept, because you're now two different tools together, and you have to have a brand that covers both of that. Sales is more complicated, except to en enable your sales team to sell more than one thing, and then support more complicated because you have a larger product footprint. Uh, if you're trying to sell to new buyers within the current customers, you'll get more money out of your current customers. Uh, they can help you go wall to wall, so you can be like the dominant tool. Uh, you get compound benefits, so like, if you're selling, like, let's say, a sales tool and a support tool, they have the same customer record, that's usually useful. Uh, what's hard here is that it's a brand new buyer and potentially uh, you might have to deal with like, more, uh, uh, how do you say, uh, more people in every single purchase, it's just more complicated. Uh, you, again, you have the brand challenge of now selling more things. Uh, you have the sales challenge, etc. And ultimately now you have two different support orgs because you have to support two different products entirely. 
And verticalization is usually a good route because you, just, you, you often just get new lines of revenue for a little additional product work, maybe a reskin of your product to make it look perfect. And there's often lower competition when you go into niche areas. There are less people doing like, you know, project management for coal mines than there are doing project management. So you can usually do pretty well out of going vertical. Uh, vertical. What's hard is oftentimes you might have to like reskin your product a little bit. You definitely have a new marketing challenge, right? Which is like, how do I reach dentists or how do I reach like hotels or hospitals? Um, sales has, needs new do domain expertise. All of their existing contacts and their Rolodex won't work here. Um, now, as you weigh up these choices, it's worth, remind, rem, uh, it's worth me reminding you of the mistakes we made in 2021 and 2022. One, friction is exponential. It is not linear. Every time you add something, something suffers. Secondly, everything for somebody is more important than being something for everybody, right? That is the only way you build a healthy business is by being everything to somebody so that that buyer loves you, as opposed to having a foot in the door for everyone, but no one really cares. Um, ultimately, you want as much cash as possible for as little code as possible. And the last point I'd say in this is just beware the asymmetry of mediocrity, right? So if you add a piece of, if you add a shit product to a healthy product line, you lose your product brand. Right? People taught you it was a great, great software company. You add one bad product to it, and everyone's like, oh, I thought those guys were good. Right? And that is a real challenge you see a lot of people suffer from. I often liken this to the idea that if you put, say, a cockroach in a bowl of strawberries, that's disgusting. If you put a strawberry, in a bowl of cockroaches, that's also disgusting, right? There is an asymmetry at play here, right? And so if you add a shit product to a business, it makes it a shit business. If you add a good product to a shit product business, it's still a shit product business. It's just worth remembering. Now, there's one other way we can grow our businesses going forward, and it's a very important one. Oh yeah, it's AI. So this will be my, my sort of last point to talk about. Um, AI is a game changer. Let me just start with that, right? And I'll say more on this, but generally speaking, tools can be disruptive if it's just that they found a new way to sell, or they can be technology breakthroughs like the Segway or Google Glass or whatever, where like, yeah, that was cool tech, but ultimately the market didn't give a shit, right? Uh, but a, a game changer is when the market wants it and the tech is there as well, and the tech is breakthrough. We are looking at a game changer. This is at least as big as the first circuit board, the first PC, the first good PC, the first operating system, the internet, phones. To me and to the folks in Intercom, we believe that AI is basically a meteor strike coming for the software industry, right? There is not a single business that will not be affected. AI will, will change everything in some ways, and it will change some things in every way. And if you're not on board with that, you're really going to struggle over the next few years. And just to explain this a little bit better, once my Meteor graphic is finished playing. Uh, so oftentimes VCs like to do these landscape maps where they try and explain what businesses are where. And I've spent the majority of my entire life on that little logo there. That is the sum total of Des's entire career, right? And that actually sits in an even bigger world, right? Which is all of this shit, right? Now, AI is going to destroy all of those businesses unless they survive and then thrive. And I really do mean survive. So how do you survive? Well, Darwin's origin of species tells us this. Um, it is not the species that's biggest or strongest. It is the one who is most able to adapt. And that is the thing I'll encourage you to do most, adapt. We have seen how tech does this before. This is the famous evolution of the desk video. You've probably seen it, right? We have seen how this whole world plays out before. The entire office changed around us, one by one, and that's where we ended up, right? And it's curious to see there's three devices left, glasses, a, a laptop, and a phone. That's where I think we are going to be over the next year when Vision Pro launches. Now, what will AI do to software? Well, well AI, I think, could do to software is something like this. Here's all the icons we know and love, but I think AI can replace so many of these things, and they could all get absorbed into some central intelligence, right? Where you just say, hey, Siri, order me a taxi. And Siri doesn't give a shit if it's Bolt or Uber or Freenow or anything like that. It just orders you, right? Easy. And similarly, you could say, order me a pizza. And all of the complexity of the software is hidden away. You know, take a reminder. Remind me to do this. Set an appointment. All of the calendaring shit, don't bother me with that. Everything gets hidden behind this. So it's worth asking, what has actually, what is AI done so far. We are really good at text. We are really good at conversation. We are really good at generating imagery and gener generating voice and video. And we are really good at deductive logic, right? And we've seen all these cute demos before. Um, and 
like, for example, you've seen Dolly and all that sort of shit where it's like, ooh, like, do, go give me a children's storybook or something like that. And it's pretty impressive stuff. I think I often get pushback from folks saying, well, what's the business application of any of this shit? And, uh, and I'll show you, right? There's, like, there's some real obvious business application. Uh, I have a friend who works in an email startup. And he said, AI's got nothing to do with him. And I said, really? Most of your users aren't good designers, are they? No. OK. Look what happens when you ask AI to design me an email newsletter for a French restaurant. Now, P.S., most people who own French restaurants aren't good designers of like fucking email software, right? So you have, you know, can this do it? Can it also write you the email? Uh, it'll actually help you write the email, and it'll structure it all. And what you get is actually far better than most of us could possibly do. Now, there are probably 50 designers in the crowd in front of me here who are going to say, Des, I could do way better. And that's not my point. My point is there are 950 people in front of me who definitely can't do better. And that's what's changed here. Similarly, um, sorry, one second. Um, in the intercom, we built a product that does customer support called Finn. And Finn literally sits in front of your support team and answers all of the undifferentiated heavy lifting that support teams get. How do I reset my password? How do I get a new API key? How do I get a refund? How do I do this? How do I do that? All of the shit that's very, very simple to do. We launched Finn in July. It's already answered about 2 million questions. It's been used by 1,000 customers. Some people see resolution rates in 50, 60, 70% of their total support volume gone. And that's just crazy. Like the, the whole world is changing here. And this is that meteor strike that I'm t telling you. If you're selling seats in traditional help desk software right now, things are changing. Uh, so just sh a simple example. This is not a Finn pitch. But like you can ask Finn a question, and it will answer, because it goes and it reads the docs, and it links up the docs, and it gives you the exact answer. In this case, I asked it, how do I disable this setting? It tell, told me exactly how to do it. But people think, right, that's an easy question, a, sim a simple question, si sorry, single question, single answer. There's also stuff like this where, like, hey, here's a five-part question. Bam, here's a five-part answer. This shit is freaking huge, right? Our entire industry is changing in front of us. So you should ask yourself, what types of core workflows in your software is changing, given that AI can do all of these things easily, right? It can write, summarize, it can create success criteria, it can optimize criteria, it can take actions, it can, it can find you the next thing to do, et cetera. Everything changes. I have a friend who runs an advertising startup where they, 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 they let you find your best ads to run. And he asked me, will AI affect his product? I said, well, what's your product do? People log in and do all this stuff, right? That's the typical workflow. It turns out, I asked ChatGPT, can you come up with five new ads? Give me five new ad visuals, run the five new ads, calculate the LTV CAC. It does it all, without even blinking. It does it all. So now, what, what does the new product look like? You just log in, and AI does its shit, and you just approve the suggestions? Like, let's pretend that we're, ne we're needed to approve the suggestions. We know where it's going is the AI is just going to do it all anyway. So here's a point I really want to make slowly. The algorithm you should apply to your software when you think about AI is for every step in your user's workflows, if it's irrelevant in a world of AI, get rid of it. If the AI can do it, get the AI to do it. If the AI can massively simplify it, do that instead. If the AI can make it a bit easier, sure. And otherwise, don't worry about it yet, maybe. The other thing I'd say is chat UI is coming as well. So chat UI being, here's a big clunky tool called Workday. Uh, I regularly have to log into Workday. And what I really, really want to do is just say, book me October 14th off, please. I don't want to learn the UI at all. Unfortunately, I have to, right? Because uh, they don't have this tool. But this is coming, right? Uh, it is, we all know, for example, uh, Microsoft Excel, OK? Uh, a, a typical thing people like to do in Excel is make some cells red if they're negative. It's really hard to do. It's called conditional formatting, right? Literally, it's changing now. Here's the instructions of how you do it in Microsoft Excel today. You go through all these steps, and I guarantee you we are like months away from a better world where you're going to log in, and you're just going to say instead, hey there, I would like to make the negative cells red, please return. And that's going to happen, right? Because that's the way the world's going to work. We're just going to tell the software what we want and get what we want. What that does is it means the people who know what they want to do are equal to the people who can use your product, right? Uh, before chat, you had to have an, a friend who knew Excel. After chat UI, you, everyone knows Excel, right? We all just say the things we want to do. So the questions to ask yourself is, how can AI be used to apply new features that kill workflows? Is chat UI relevant? How can it uh, be applied to let people do things they couldn't do before, whether it's design or creativity of any sort? 
Another thing you should ask yourself is, are my customers ready for this? There's an adoption thing here. If you're too early, like say Google Glass or Segway, you're wrong. And 10 years later, Vision Pro or like scooters come along and it turns out they had the right timing. So what does this mean for your strategy? Well, here's the way I think about it. Let's say my friend who's building an email startup. He's now all in on email and he says, right, it's going to be mail.ai and we're going to do AI to kill MailChimp and campaign monitor and Clavio and Braze and all that. Sounds great, dude. So here's what his roadmap looks like. He has those two black boxes there is all his fancy AI shit. And he still has to build all this other stuff. Okay? So when he compares his roadmap with, say, MailChimp's, they have to build these two things, and he has to build all of the above. So another way of saying it is he's probably not going to win. If you're a startup, the bad news, sorry, if you're a startup, the good news is uh, you're basically, you have an opportunity. Sorry, let go forward a slide. Uh, if, you're, if you're the incumbent, the bad news is you're now in an AI arms race with your competitors, and you're in a battle for survival. But this is a massive opportunity to win the market. The key question to ask yourself always is how can all this new AI shit make it quicker, faster, easier, or more accessible for more people to use my product? That is how you will thrive in AI. You will not thrive by shutting it out. You will thrive by asking these questions. This is a massive tectonic shift in tech, right? We've been through loads of these. We've, this AI is just one of these. Uh, it's of similar size, in my opinion, the nature of what's going to happen to our industry in the next while. And even within tech, we've gone from the PC to the cloud era, to the mobile era, to the VR and AR era. AI is the next era. It's, it will leave nothing unturned when it lands. So I said I'd try to explain how we re re-accelerate through this time of change. I believe all of this is valid. Find your healthy core, kill all your complexity, optimize your business. Then you expand it and think very seriously, potentially going all in on AI. Now, there's a quote I love that I recite all the time internally, and folks are sick of hearing it, which is, in times of change, learners inherit the earth, while the people who are perfectly learned find themselves beautifully equipped to deal with a world that no longer exists. A lot of the tech that we look at when we look at AI used to be shit we talk about as, one day it'll be possible for the machines to blah, blah, blah. And what I say to you here is, this is actually day one. So I wish you the best. This is an awesome time to be building tech. I hope this presentation has been useful. I'm Des Trainer from Intercom. Thanks very much.